Welcome everyone to another episode of Early Days, where entrepreneurship meets storytelling. Proudly presented by Proust Chown. Get ready to be inspired by this individual. And uh, you're like me, you're kind of a radio announcer, but you're also a businessman. And I'm, that's what I'm fascinated to hear all of the elements today. Jason Granger, welcome to the show. Jackie Ray, how are you doing? Pretty darn good. We work in the same building, Sports 1440. I know I'm in charge of the heat and the air conditioning. I'm going to work on that. Yeah, the AC does need a little bit of work, especially in the summertime. And no one, no one needs to see me doing my shirt uh, show with the shirt off all the time, but it's getting to that point. It's getting to that point. Uh, you born and raised Edmontonian? Or? Uh, well, New Sarepta. Get a oh, shout out okay. to uh, New Sarepta. We actually, um, our, my mother sold the farm 51 years, and uh, she's, she's moving. My mom turns 80 in next spring, and my dad's been gone for, geez, 24 years, so... Um, you know, we had a really good run and uh, just kind of slowly being downsized in it. But yeah, I grew up in New Strept. I lived in the Duke for a short time. I uh, have lived in Edmonton, I guess, and, and St. Albert since I was probably 21. But. So growing up in New Sarepta uh, radio, is that what you were drawn to or, or was it more sports? Well, I was a big sports guy, um, probably from a young age. I, I think my first introduction really was the Edmonton Journal, and I read it every day, right? Like, we had it delivered. My mom's, my mom's highly educated. She's, um, you know, she's got her doctorate in education, so she's, uh, you know, she wanted us to be educated. She didn't force it on it, but it was, it was subtle messages, but it was great. I like to read, and, you know, I was a decent student, so... Um, you know, my brother and I would race to see who get the paper first because you always won the sports section. And then if you didn't get it, maybe you read the comics and wait. But I, you know what? I was a big sports fan. And then uh, living at the farm, uh, driving home from hockey with my dad lots. Uh, John Short was on the radio at night from uh, 9 to midnight. And so that was definitely a real big influence. It took me a while to get into it, but that was definitely something I always wanted to do. I just kind of went around uh, a little bit longer path than most. So you decide out of high school to go uh, to Nate? Did you go right away? Or? No, God, no. I was, I was, you know, <laughs> playing, you know, low level junior hockey, nothing special, and working in the oil field. And uh, I worked in the oil field till I was twenty seven. And uh, one day, just you know what, I was like, I had enough. A um, guy I roomed with, and he snored. I stayed up late all night. Finally, I had to go sleep with a duvet and the bathroom floor. And I'm like, God, there's got to be more to life than this. And I have the utmost respect for the oil field. I worked in it. Uh, I saw the, you know, the challenges it can present for people for sure. But it wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted to do, right? So even when I was there, I was always reading the paper both every day, like front to back, just to kind of keep me fresh. I always knew sports. I have a really good memory. And uh, like I used to play games with all the guys that I worked with and take their money from, you know, we'd ask like numbers and sports and stuff. And I was good at that. So <laughs> I finally just had had enough. And I went back to school when I was 27. I had to upgrade at Nate and in the college prep pro program, which is a little humbling. But then I went into a RTA and uh, really lucked out. I never had to leave Edmonton. I was, you know, born in a small community, grew up on the farm. I was fully prepared to go to Lloyd Minster or or Moose Jaw or wherever I was going to have to go, which is normally the case. But I kind of lucked out and did my practicum with John Short in Edmonton and kind of the rest is history from there. Just kind of a lot of doors kept opening up and I was able to run through them. And a pretty remarkable at 27 years of age to make that quick life change. Did you, did you write it down with your goal sets or what did, what did you do before that? Well, I do remember coming home and, uh, you know, I called my mom and said, Hey, I got it. Like, I don't want to work in the oil field anymore. Um, I, you know, I think I want to go into radio, but I didn't really, really even know what to do. Like, you know, I want to go in journalism. So I looked that up and, you know, my mom's like, well, just go to RTA at Nate. And so I was like, all right. So, so I applied and, you know, they, they recommend, well, you go do college prep courses because, you know, I kind of lollygagged a little bit in high school. And, um, but I went back and, you know, the, still probably the biggest, and this is funny, but the biggest disappointment in life was when I got 99 in math and college prep because I got one wrong in the final. It still bothers me. Just something about having 100% would have been nice. But I, I never, uh, um, I just, I didn't have a plan really per se. And um, because what I, what I ended up doing, I didn't even know it was possible. Right. Um, running my own company, it's kind of unique as far as owning your own radio show. I didn't, I didn't really know that was a possibility. Like when I went to, to Nate in, in 2000, I guess 99, graduated in 2001, there was no sales course. But now in RTA, there's a sales course, right? They understand like, if, if you want to be on air or you want to be in sales, like it's very important. It's kind of funny that they never really had that because anybody will tell you the, you know, the salespeople are arguably more important than the on-air people because if you don't bring advertisers, then who cares how good your show is because no one's paying you to put you on the air. So 
Um, I kind of lucked out by working with John because John Short was renting his airtime at Oldies 1260. And him and Bob Suter, they would they had a nine to midnight show. It was Oldies during the day, and then he had a show nine to midnight. And so when I started with him, I got out of school, I did my practicum. I actually I was supposed to do my practicum at Ched. And then John, like three weeks before, was like, well, why aren't you doing it with me? And I was like, I didn't even know that was an option. And so I, then I changed quickly and you know, it was the best decision I made. And so I learned from John a lot of business stuff, some things how to do business and somehow not to do business, which is sometimes the best way you learn. And then in, in 2005, after having worked together for a few years and I was starting to get good at sales, but I wasn't making any money. All the money was going into a pot and I was getting a small percentage of it. And I was like, I got to sink or swim. So 2005, I was what, 32. And I just, I went to John and I, and I went to Marty Forbes and Carl Stark at the radio station and said, hey guys, can I rent my airtime? Which was 11 p.m., Jackie, till 1 a.m. Oh, I didn't so know that was your initial that show. Was, that okay. was my first like full-time show. And I'm yeah. like, if I can sell 11 p.m. till 1 a.m., I can probably sell any time. But I didn't, I didn't, I was naive enough to not know that it was supposed to be difficult, right? And um, how my business started, like I didn't have a business degree. I never took an MBA or anything. I literally, one of my buddies, Scott, who had an MBA, he sent me a contract form, like kind of a blank one as an invoice. This is how you invoice your clients. And I, I literally started on an Excel spreadsheet and said, okay, column A, this is what my expenses are. Column B, this is what I'm going to have to pay, like on air, this, this, and then this is what I'm going to want to make. So how much am I going to have to bring in? And it just kind of started from there. And I would say to anybody in business, the best decision I ever made was Paul, my accountant, who I'd met in the sports community. I'd emceed a lot of, he was the actually, he was the ringette coach at the U of A ringette club. And he was also, so I had emceed a few of their events. And one day I was just talking to him about, you know, I'm going to start my own company. I don't really know how to start an own company. He's like, well, I'm an accountant. I'll help you. And I was like, yes, please. And so whatever he said, I'm, I'm a good listener. I can, I can take uh, direction if you give it me. And so it, uh, it was the best thing when I look back and, and knowing how to pay corporate tax and GST and all these different things. And, you know, you learn from him because there's a lot of myths sometimes in business where he's like, you know, people say loopholes. Paul's like, there's no loopholes. There is legal and illegal. So, you know, pick which side you want to go on. And uh, I was like, I'll stay on the legal side. And so, you know, he there's lots of ways to, to get tax benefits for sure. But if you do it properly and make sure you pay your quarterly GST and your quarterly corporation tax, because some people think they have all this money because they haven't paid taxes all year and then come to the end of the year. And now oh, I got 60 grand in the bank. No, you don't. You owe 55 in tax. You got nothing. <laughs> so if you pay it along the year, you kind of have a better understanding. So I learned a lot about business uh, from that, but it really, it's not a, I think I'm a good example of, I mean, you just got to try. Right? Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't scared. Um, and I'm a big believer in this that I think some people overlook sometimes in life. I was lucky. My parents we had a healthy family. And when you have love in your family, I'm a big believer that that gives you a leg up on people sometimes. Because if I failed, well, my mom was still like my dad, unfortunately, was passed away, but my mom was still there. And I was like, well, my family's not going to disown me. I'm not going to be a loser if I try something that doesn't work. And so I tried it and. It worked a lot better than I ever thought it would, that's for sure. Yeah, because you, you know that net is there if something does go wrong. But you're right, the, your failures, you learn way, way more than anything. So you get 99% on math, but your first smart thing you did was hire an accountant. What is another move that you made that you went, okay, this is, I'm really glad I made this move? Um, you know what, kind of a few small ones along the way, just, um, you know, learning, like a lot of sales for me early on was was really through socializing with people. And um, like, I kind of joke for the first few years, I was like, I was on the golf charity tour. I, I probably played in 40, one summer I played in 48 charity golf tournaments. Now oh. my show was 11 p.m. at night. And so, you know, there'd be a golf tournament that was maybe two until eight. So I could still play in it, even the morning one. So I could do either one if I wanted to, right? I didn't, and like, that was a lot. Like there were some days where I would play two and it was, but it was because everywhere I went, I would meet someone talk to them about what I did. And, and people always kind of found it intriguing. And so like I met um, my first car dealership came when I got asked to play in a pro-am and I got partnered together with, uh, with Courtney Hutzel, who at the time was, was running Kia West Edmonton. And, you know, we just got to talk about what I do and stuff like this. And he's like, oh, well, do you have any car dealership? I'm like, well, actually, no, I don't. He goes, wow, I'm the GM manager at uh, Kia. I know my owner very well, Larry Ricci, really good guy. And so that kind of led to me, you know, having my first car dealership. But probably one of the best decisions I made was 
I'm not afraid to try new things. And I was probably the first radio guy to have a consistent clothing sponsor. And so, so one of my, a guy I got to know, Kelly, from, uh, that it's no longer there, but Identity Clothing. And so, you know, it was kind of the new part of the internet, so I had a website. And so one of my friends who had went to RTA, Curtis had become a photographer and an elite photographer. Curtis Como is one of the best photographers around. And so I made a deal with Curtis that he would come and take pictures once every two months and we'd be at Identity Clothing and we'd take a lot of pictures and clothes and funny. And, and I had a few girl buddies, so they would come in and, you know, because, hey, my audience is guys, they don't want to see me. But if I have a, an attractive girl in the picture, they're probably going to want to go to the website and see the clothes. And so, so it was, you learned, that was one where I learned there's different ways to create partnerships. So now you're still 11P to 1A. Are, are you making money? Is your ledger sheet that you laid out, is, are, are you paying yourself? Well, here's a true story. And I, I keep this uh, for me because um, like I grew up in a very probably middle class, maybe lower middle class family, but I, I never felt like we never had anything. I'm lucky. My mom said from a young age, like I never had a long list at Christmas. I was not. Material stuff doesn't do it for me. So um, I was actually, I had my T4 because when I was working for John and them private, my T4 was 29 grand in, uh, in 2004. And I was just like, I'm not making enough money. But I was still actually, for my life, I was fine. I was, you know what, I'm, I, have, I had a condo back when you could get a condo for like 80 grand, right? It's a different world now. But um, so I had that and I had a roommate for a bit of it. And then eventually I didn't want one anymore. But um, so I, when I started with Paul, he asked me, well, how much you want? I was like, well, I'd like to make 50. Like I thought that was going to be a good number. And he's like, okay, well, you don't need to incorporate then right away. So we, my company started on March 1st, 2005. And in September, Paul is like, hey, we got to incorporate. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're going to make more than 50 grand. I'm like, oh, this is great. Because <laughs> I, I, I didn't really follow it that like I was paying all my bills and everything and um, doing exactly what he said, keeping all receipts, doing everything that I was supposed to do. And yeah, the sales was working. Um, you know, uh, well, a friend of mine, you know, Kelly McClung, mm -hmm. she, uh, her and I had been social friends for, I don't know, a year and a half. And at one night, it's a Thursday night. And I remember it because it was one of those changing moments in, for you, for me anyway, in my business. I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I got to go to work. And she, what do you mean you have to go to work? It's 10 o'clock at night. I said, well, yeah, I'm on air at 11. She's like, what do you do? Because we were social friends, but we never talked about work. And uh, I'm like, well, I have a sports talk show and you know, I own a show and da, 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 da. And she's like, oh, well, I'm the marketing manager for Northern Alberta BC for Boston Pizza. And I'm like, huh, we might have to talk business. <laughs> so, you know, like, I think like the next week we met and had a big deal with Boston Pizza. And, and that really kind of elevated me into a, you know, like obviously they're a big, big company and mm -hmm. um, they really want to support local. So it was, it was a great partnership for, for years and, you know, did my show live there sometimes. And we, we, and so I was 11 to one and then that moved. I think I was only there for a year. Then I went nine to midnight, okay. and, uh, which is still a pretty, cause now I'm going from paying, cause I only had to pay for one hour. They, like the midnight hour, I didn't pay for it, per se. They kind of got a bonus for me, right? Because, um, but then I went from paying one hour to now I have to pay three hours of airtime. So my cost basically tripled in in one fell swoop. But you know what? I had planned on it. I knew I had more inventory, and then I just kind of started building from there. And then I I stayed at uh, nine to midnight until two thousand eight. And then in September of 2008, I moved to the drive time and I've been there ever since. And then four hours. So again, more airtime, yeah. cost you more money. Yeah. But well, it, it was three hours at first and then uh -huh. a year later it went to four. And then that's obviously the max. It's a real model. Like for those listening in the radio world, like the sports 1440 model or the model you do is, is pretty rare in the yeah. industry and that where you purchase the airtime and it's, but it's still a partnership for the radio station. So for you now that you basically own most of sports 1440, it's a, that's a huge, a lot of pressure. Yeah. That wasn't like, you know, when, when TSN closed down and I knew eventually that would happen. I didn't know the day it would happen by any stretch, but having seen what they'd done in other markets, unfortunately, and, and Edmonton's different because Edmonton's a great sports market and it's been proven time and time again. And so, um, you know, like in life, you need a little bit of luck. I think if I had tried to start this in some other city, it might not have ever worked. But Edmonton is very passionate about sports. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a real great sense of community in Edmonton that I think some cities don't necessarily have. Edmontonians, there's a lot of them. They like it here. They stay here. There's Obviously, there's some new people that come to Edmonton. But a lot of people that you meet around Edmonton have been in Edmonton for a long time. Right. It's, you know, I, I go to Calgary and it's a little bit different. Right. There's a little bit more people that move there who didn't grow up there. So they don't have that same passion. Like, you know, th this playoff run here, every kid who's 
eight and up is now a diehard order fan. It was like the greatest time of their life, right? And then the older fans are all like, oh, this is fun again. I remember this, right? So, and that kind of sticks with people, I think, a little bit. So, um, you know, being there in Edmonton, I think, was, was a help. And then you know, when it closed down, you know, a lot of people, there's podcasts. And, and I respect it. It's great. I do a podcast myself. But I'm probably biased. I grew up listening to sports talk radio. It's live. It's, it's in your vehicle. You can connect to people. And like for me, like when I think of sports radio, I think of moments with my dad and creating mm-hmm. conversations, um, talking about what we heard on the radio, maybe the next day or different things like that. And it was just sometimes you don't have to say anything to feel a bond when you're, when you're riding with your father. And I'm a big believer in, in the importance of fatherhood. And I think it gets downplayed too much in our society. And so I'm a big proponent of that. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like, you know what? Dads and moms, of course, listen. But I think, you know, my audience is probably more men than, than women. And I'm like, I want to give that opportunity to them. And so I didn't just want to quit. So I knew Susan from um, my time at, at Bell Media. So, you know, she reached out to me. And then, you know, like, I'll be honest, I didn't plan to, <laughs> to, to take on as much as I did. But I felt it was something that the community needed. Mm-hmm. And I felt the community would, would support. And so far they have probably even more than, than I expected. And, and now it's grown and, you know, you need other, like you need good people and, you know, Kevin and, and low tide and, you know, our, our really young guys in Declan and Brandon and Connor and Donovan, it's, you know, John Short gave me an opportunity. So I'm a big believer. I want to give those guys opportunity. Now it's up to them to want to bang the door down. Like I can open it, but now they got to run through it. I right? kind of like, I felt like what I did. John gave me the opportunity and then I busted through the door and did a lot of things myself. I'm, I'm pretty self-motivated and, I kind of like people that are self-motivated. I get, I'm not a big micromanager. I don't want to do that. So there, there is a little bit of pressure there, I think, mm-hmm. t- to be honest, because beforehand, I used to, used to look in the mirror and say, hey, idiot, be better, because there was really no one else. But now there's, <laughs> you have a team. Uh, there's other people. Yeah. And so, yeah, you feel responsible in a way that I'd never really, I think, like big business owners, I couldn't imagine that when they have 100, 200, you know, how many employees they have. And that's like, there's a lot of pressure there because you're supporting their livelihood now. Right. And you're helping them and you want them to go. So you want to be successful because now they can still have a successful life. One thing I found with uh, obviously I work with you at Sports 1440. When I listen to you, I I'm so blown away that your knowledge of so many different sports and people. And but you nailed it earlier where you said you've always had a great memory when you were reading the journal. You would have to. I just I, I'm I'm boggled. My mind's boggled by the amount of information you suddenly just spew out and go, holy crap, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my wife will say that's annoying sometimes. But <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know what? It's, it, I thought my brother one time told me when, when I first started radio, he goes, you know what? You've been preparing this for your whole life without really knowing it, right? Like I read about sports, I had a passion for it. I remember, you know, dating myself, anybody who's, who's an 80s child or 90s would remember the Edmonton Journal and Tuesday, the sports section came out and it had all the league stats of every team. And that was just like, oh my God, this was, this was like your moment of the week because I could read all the stats and I loved absorbing it. So you'd memorize and this. And so I would go through every team. And so that's how you kind of got to know the players more and then baseball, the same thing. And so I've kind of always done that. And so you have a lot of that stuff is just, it's in like sometimes it's like useless information some days really and all of a sudden someone will mention someone oh yeah well, i remember so and so this just some obscure number and people look like how the hell did you know that i said well i read it from when i was 10 and i read it 11 i read it at 12 and so it, it just kind of sticks in you and i think anybody who's passionate about something you, you do remember things more just because like that's what I like. Like my son now, he, uh, I love it when, you know, he's reading books on statistics and stuff. Cause you know, maybe cause dad does it a little bit, but I did it cause my mom introduced me to reading right from a young age. Like we read. And so he's been a reader. And so now like he comes to me with stats and some days I'm like, what the, ugh, I got to kind of BS, <laughs> what have I created I gotta BS here? my way through it. I'm like, Oh yeah. What do you think? <laughs> So, cause he'll follow things that I don't necessarily follow, right? You, you can't follow everything. So, but I do have to, it's important, I think, in sports talk radio to not just be a hockey guy, right? Um, I mm-hmm. did play by play for the rush for 10 years. I did junior football play by play. I did junior hockey play by play. So I like all sports. Like I love the Olympics right now. So, um, it's, it's fun to me to, to be able to, to research and, and look up all that stuff. How do you feel it's changed? Like you read a lot of the text, the text versus the phoning. I remember back in the day, like you listening to John Short after hockey games and you go, hang up on that idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but now, now it's more texting, right? So it's, yeah, you, you can, 
You know, we get a lot of texts, and um, so you can kind of weed through the uh, the texts that, that you like. And but sometimes it's important to read the ones you don't like. Like you want to mm-hmm. give it. Not everybody's going to agree, and if everybody agreed in sports talk radio, it'd be the worst, mm-hmm. right? So you, you, there's going to be people who who disagree with something, and which is great. And you know what? I think, and, and to me, like I like debating. I'm all for debate. So I'm like, you want to bring a counterpoint? Now it's on. Let's go. Because you know, your opinion's only valid to the point you can defend it. It was the greatest advice I ever got from someone. And it's like, so I'm a big believer. If, if I'm going to discuss a topic, then I want to make sure I got some ammo to back up my point. I, I'm not trying to change your opinion. I just want to ensure that mine has you know some common sense to it. And sadly, in our society today, with with social media. People will just, they retweet and share stuff that's factually incorrect. Mm-hmm. And, and we've become a little bit, well, that's okay. And then, and sadly, like, I don't know when it's changed, not to get off on a, but I don't know when it's changed in our political landscape that now it's okay to insult and lie about things that I don't recall that now. Maybe I wasn't heavily as involved in, in politics in my twenties, but I don't recall there being as much of an insult in politics and so much about, well, you're left or right. I'm like, like, and maybe because in my household, like my parents, they weren't staunch one way or the other. Yeah. Some days they voted Same. conservative. Sometimes they voted liberal. Like it, it depended on, on the, on the person running and depended on the time. And so like, it, it, now it seems we're either really far right or really far left. But the truth is, Jack, I think the majority of us are in the middle. I think you're right. Yeah. But the middle mm-hmm. people, we need to be more vocal because we just kind of, well, you know what? Eventually sanity is going to come through here in <laughs> common sense. But I don't think so. so I don't think so we, either. We, we, I always joke. I said, we need some extremists in the middle <laughs> to, to just say, hey, wait a sec. That's not right. But I, I don't know. We, for whatever reason, the, the, the central people are maybe they're just a little calmer and they don't... They, I don't know what it is, but it yeah. is it is a problem. And so on the text line, you get that sometimes. But to me, it's sports. It's very different, right? Like, I mm-hmm. like sports because at the end of the day, I'm like, hey, you like Conor McDavid. You like Leon Dreisaitl. You like Zach Hyman. Great. It doesn't, it's not going to change, like, our livelihood. Whereas if, you know, somebody's cutting back on a, on a, um, on a tax cut or on childcare, well, that's actually going to impact people's ability to do something. So it's nice that I get to play in a, in a pool that's not, you know, that... Um, uh, not that sports doesn't mean anything. It means a lot, but it, it's a different level. It's like entertainment and it's like a release from the everyday garbage sometimes. It, yeah, you're not wrong at all. Can I ask about uh, the Gregor Foundation? I'm just so impressed with what you do for the community. And I think I'm getting a feel now with what your parents in, uh, left you, a very definite thing that you have to give back. Yeah, and you know what's funny? Um, it really came from my dad. But not so with, my dad was never a real big talker. He didn't like sit down and, okay, son, listen here. Like, I, I, I do remember vividly some of the things he told me. And um, my dad would grow up very poor. And I didn't know this till I was in my 20s. And um, because he, he, they grew up quite poor, from my understanding. From my, and he didn't talk about it. My, my, my mom told us a little bit later on. And so he, he was always, he didn't like to spend money. Like, he would buy, my mom always had the best car. He would drive the junker. Right. And he wanted to make sure that everything was good there. But, you know, he didn't he would wear the same pair of jeans for four years. He he didn't care about it because he just didn't need it. So but he did tell me once about when we had no money in the 80s, he had lost his job in the oil field, surprisingly. And um, (laughs) he uh, we were downtown. I was 12 years old or the bus depot. I don't even know why we're there. I don't remember that. But I just remember some guy coming up to my dad was in tears and crying how he needed 20 bucks to get on a bus. And so my dad's, well, I'll go buy you the ticket. So I bought him a ticket. And I remember being like in the car at home, like, well, dad, you wouldn't buy me a hockey stick because you said we don't have any money, which was true. But dad's like, well, we had more money than that guy. And he goes, we can, he goes, we can afford that. He needed the 20 bucks more than we did. And I was just like, I was 12. I'm like, what? I want a hockey stick, you know? Um, and it's one of those things that I never really thought about it till later. And then when my dad passed away, it had a big impact on my life. I was 27. And so one day I just, I'd heard about Cinderella's Closet, which is a great charity for, for girls. And this kind of goes back to my thing where guys sometimes aren't the best at supporting men. We're not the best at it. And especially nowadays where we need to be more. And so Cinderella's Closet provides dresses for high school grads who can't afford one. And lots of women donate their dresses and it's great. It's awesome. So I was like, well, boys work just as hard. They want to graduate. They want to look good. I, I don't care who you are. Anybody listening, watching right now, if you go put that suit on the first time, it could be your hundredth suit, it could be your first suit. You're like, hey, what's happening, right? Every time, it doesn't matter. And so I was like, well, we, we should do that. So 
you know, I looked around, there wasn't really a charity that did that. So it kind of started on a whim. And the first year we, we got all donations because I joked. I said, I know there's how many guys listening right now who have, I would say this on my show, you got a suit in your closet, dude, you're never fitting in it again. Like the dream's over. It's not, it's past. You're not fitting in that suit again, right? Like you're 30, you're maybe you're slender at 20, whatever it is. You suddenly you hit the weight room, it's never fitting again. And lots of guys were like, yeah, I got one of those. And lots of women were like, yeah, my husband's got a lot of those. So we got tons of donations, which was great. And, and at the time, uh, Paige cleaned them all for free. But the problem was high school boys don't fit 40s and they don't fit 42s. They're like 34s and 36, right? They got no shoulders yet. So we learned the hard way. So after that, now I just raise all the money. And uh, so I just, I, I have, I have some great sponsors, um, Jared Priestner at Go Auto and Taran San with the GS Construction and the Collins Brothers at Collins Steel, like, you know, great local companies that just, you know, they make donations to it. Um, I'm a big believer, like my charity is 100%. There's zero overhead. All the money we raise goes directly to the suits. And I team up with Sterling at Mr. Dirks and the kids come in and they get treated like everybody else. I didn't want, I, I wanted it. So when those kids got a suit, that no one, if they went to their grad, would know it was a donated suit, right? So they get a new suit, they get to pick out their color. They're like, we have four or five different colors. And then they get shirts and shoes and ties and socks and a pocket square. And then Papa John's brings them pizza <laughs> when we fit them. And this past year, like we're now, when we started, we had 30 kids. This past year, we did 212. And uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's caused a lot more fundraising, which is, you know, I look at that and say, well, that's, that's a problem, but it's a good problem to have. And, um, you know, you get some of these letters, like I'm a crier, so I'll try not to cry, but you get some of these letters from kids afterwards and that suit, it gives them confidence. And it's the most important thing you can give someone. Yeah. Imagine what they, they'll remember this. Oh, yeah. Let's say years down the road and yeah. suddenly that was the beginning of, I can remember that. Yeah. I was treated with respect too. Yeah. Well, that's, you know what? It's true. Like yeah. St Sterling and all the guys at, at Mr. Dirk's and the teachers come and they're like, like a lot of these kids have never been in a store like that, right? Mm. And and they get to see that stuff. And they they come out of that mirror the, and they look in that mirror the first time and you can kind of see them grow an inch or two and it gives them a lot of confidence and and, we, and it's not a rental though. So I always like to surprise them, like the teachers know it, but we don't, so when the boys come, you know, and, and I try to bring one of my sponsors in because I'm like, I want you to see where your money's going. Mm -hmm. And it makes an impact for kids. And then a lot of listeners, like, you know, we do donations on the show. And obviously I donate uh, a lot myself. I'm not a big believer in like my company and our family donates. That's a big donation for me because I don't like asking for money if I don't put up my own money. I just kind of a little awkward with that. So uh, especially, you know, some of these companies put up a big amount. So oh, wow. um, it's, uh, it's really, it's, you know what, it's a, it's a very rewarding thing to do. And it's just, it's nice to see, you know, that the, how happy the kids are to give someone joy is, is, is something that you can't put a price tag on. And so for me, I like to, I still go to all the fittings, right? I kind of try to rush in there on a Tuesday. We do it this year. We had like four fittings. So you do like 50 kids in a span of four hours. And, um, you know, it's kind of a well-oiled machine now with Mr. Dirk and, and the schools and, um, you know, so they, they know which kids really need it. And it, it makes, uh, I think it makes a big difference because they get to keep the suit. And then if they go to a job interview or they go somewhere else, they just, they have a little, and for some of them, they're like, I never would have went to grad because they didn't have the money. And I'm like, man, you, you work 12 years to graduate. And for some of these kids, they don't have a lot of support at home. Um, just you, sometimes you deserve a win. Yeah, no kidding. And that's really what you give them. You give them a win and they're like, hey, and now I can do something else. I have to say that this has been the easiest interview I've ever done. Uh -huh. I love talking with other radio guys. This uh -huh. has been wonderful. If somebody wants to give to the Gregor Foundation or if they want to buy advertising on Sports 1440, where should we go? Uh, you know what? Just You can go to jasongregor.com. Uh, that's probably the easiest way there. And you know, my email is just you know, jasongregorshow at gmail.com. It's, uh, it's pretty simple. Thanks to our presenting sponsor, Prost Chowen. As we conclude another episode, let's reflect on the journey ahead. Prost Chowen is here to light the way for entrepreneurs, offering support from corporate services to beyond. Embrace the challenges and remember you're not alone on the path. You always need help, don't you? 100%. Uh, John Short gave me a chance once. And I'm really happy he did. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jackie. This series is proudly produced by the team at Road 55. Road 55 creates content that connects. For more information, visit our website at road55.ca.